a brief announcement before today's video. I have opened a spread shop. Uh, you should be able to see uh, down below the description. Uh, there should be some of the items there. I'll also put a link directly in the description in the pinned comment. Uh, go check that out. It's not much. It's, you know, it's pretty humble, but um, there's a few bits and bobs there that you guys might like. The money that I make from that, I'll probably just reinvest getting more artwork and putting it back into uh, making cool stuff for you guys. So um, check it out. All right, today at the request of Navar Corella, we're going to talk about Makos and no, not the sharks. In covering 22nd century lore, we can't really not cover the Makos. They are a pretty integral part of that period. But they're also very interesting. Now, I could make a video called What Happened to the Makos, but what happened to them is really quite self-explanatory. Please don't make me say it. The Romulan War happened, and the Makos didn't have a whole hell of a lot to do during that conflict, and so was soon disbanded after. There's other reasons as well, and we'll get into that. But so really, what's more interesting to look at with the Makos is why they even existed to begin with. What did they exist to do? Why, why were they there? What were they needed for? That's what we're going to really look at today, is we're going to try and work out what the origins of the Makos were, because I think they are going to be quite integral to telling, you know, even that pre-Enterprise story of early human space travel. So, let's get into it. So, there's a few things we can observe about the Makos. Uh, they are more competent than their Starfleet security counterparts. Now, granted, that's not saying much. They have unique uniforms, equipment, and tactics. They are wholly separate from Starfleet. It's not like, say, for example, the US Marines or the, the Royal Marines that will share a lot of equipment and, and bits and bobs with the Army or the, the Navy. These are a completely separate force. They have literally nothing in common with Starfleet. They use completely different weapons, they wear completely different uniforms, uh, their training is very different. They're less like a sister military and almost more like a foreign military. And then the Romulan War happens and they have nothing to do because that's a purely ship-to-ship -ship conflict. If they had fought a war against the Klingons, now that perhaps would have given them a little bit more to do and perhaps we'd be talking about the Makos still today. So, the real question, as I say, is why do they exist to begin with? While the existence of the Makos seems perfectly sensible and reasonable to us, you know, being as we are a 21st century people, it doesn't necessarily follow for the 22nd century. Different military forces exist for a reason, and their existence should not be taken for granted. There's a reason. I mean, like, for example, when aircraft were coming in, there was a whole conversation about whether or not we would even need a separate air force. Now, ultimately, the people who pushed for separate air forces won that discussion, but there was plenty of ideas of saying, oh, no, air should be an additional branch of service in the army or the navy. There wasn't necessarily that belief that it needed to be a distinct and separate force. So that's something to bear in mind, is that not every military force necessarily has to exist. So we need to find out why and how they were created, and when. So we're going to look at three historical events that may have prompted them. The first event we'll discuss as being the least important in the story of the Makos is the Martian independence crisis. Now, we are delving into a lot of deep lore here, so, you know, brace yourselves. From an out-of-universe perspective, Martian independence is a very common line in most science fiction. It's because most science fiction writers are American, and most American writers want to refight the Revolutionary War in space! And that's kind of what happens with most Martian independence um, stories. Most of the other science fictions which feature it, like The Expanse, have good reason for that to work. There's a lot of in-universe like rules that mean that that would logically happen. That's not the case in 
Star Trek's timeline. You see, the first successful manned mission to Mars was in 2030, and proper Martian colonies are not established until 2103. When we mean colonies, I mean big dome cities with, you know, large civilian populations, not just a bunch of engineers and scientists living in a cabin. That's what a colony is. It's a big dome population that is self-sustaining. And that didn't exist until 2103. So that's well into the 22nd century. Now, there is something to, that is worth pointing out, and that is that the United Earth government did not form until 2130. So another 27 years. So that would mean that there was the space for Mars to begin to develop its separate identity. This is true. Uh, the Mars colonies would not be just automatically United Earth because the United Earth government did not exist. When Mars is growing, there is no singular Earth government. So there's no reason why they would have to submit to said Earth government. They could just, you know, run themselves as essentially just another nation that just happens to be on another planet. When the United Earth is formed in 2130, it claims jurisdiction over the entirety of the Sol system. Now, Mars declares independence because they've spent, you know, at least 27 years not really being governed by Earth, and now Earth is saying, no, we, we're in charge. And uh, Mars is like, well, no, you weren't. You weren't in charge for the last 27 years, so why should you be in charge now? There's a problem with this, and this is, of course, that Earth has a military monopoly. Mars does not, because Mars has only really existed as a colony for 27 years. That's enough time to form a, perhaps a separate identity. It's not really enough to build up a robust military, technological, and industrial base. So, Mars is in no way capable of resisting the military force of Earth. What happens is, of course, Mars says, we are going to be independent... Um, and we don't recognize your sovereignty over the entire solar system. And then the Makos are prepared for war. You're going to fly over and deploy the Makos, suppress the Martians, and install a, a friendly government. Fortunately, it doesn't come to pass, because negotiations are ultimately prevail. Basically, it's resolved peacefully, and Mars agrees to become a independent protectorate. So... The rest of the Sol system, yeah, that falls under United Earth control, but Mars is a little independent enclave that runs itself, but in terms of foreign policy and, and military policy, it's subordinate to the United Earth and is reliant on the United Earth. So ultimately, what we find is that the, the Martian independence crisis, such as it was, doesn't really give us a good reason for the Makos to exist. Number one, it would require that the Makos already existed. And two, the Makos don't really do anything. So, given the Makos don't do anything, and they would have to already exist, this is not the place to look for the origins of the Makos. So let's go back to the post-atomic horror. What a delightful time. You have World War Three in about 2050-ish, some point about 2050. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's skirmishes and various localized conflicts across the globe in the build-up to that, but you have the big nuclear exchange. I say big nuclear exchange. It was actually a relatively limited nuclear exchange around about 2050. It was enough of a nuclear exchange not to kill the planet, but to destroy most major governments or render most major governments pretty much ineffective. And this meant that you had a lot of warlords running around and doing whatever they felt like. And you had some pretty interesting characters, shall we say, men like Colonel Green, who were basically just running around and killing at will. This lasts about 10 years, 10 to 20 years, actually, because you have then, of course, the warp flight in... 2063 and the Vulcans land so the nations of earth number one have to find a way of all talking to the Vulcans and the Vulcans also are not going to play uh, politics they want to talk to all of earth or not at all you're not going to just say oh only the Americans can talk to the Vulcans or only the Russians can talk to the Vulcans no everyone 
has to be able to talk to the Vulcans. So you get the beginnings of the kind of the what will become the United Earth government, but slowly. At the same time, you've also got uh, Zephram Cochrane kind of holding all of the nations of Earth in balance because he's got the monopoly on warp drive. Zephram Cochrane was being very careful in that if he was only beholden to one nation, they could have power of coercion over him. Whereas, if he was beholden to all the nations, or all the nations were beholden to him as the father of warp drive, they couldn't coerce or threaten him. So Cochrane was very careful in, in sort of balancing himself and inevitably kind of drawing all the nations of the earth together, sometimes in frustration at his um, stubbornness. But that was Cochrane. So that's all going on a further 10 years after First Contact. So we would probably say that the beginnings of not a united earth government but global consensus shall we say uh you would probably start to see that around about 2070 2073 ish at that point one of the first things of global consensus is okay the third world war that's everyone's fault we all all the nations of the world at least all the belligerents accept equal responsibility for the third world war and the resulting nuclear exchange the war criminals from all the sides are all going to be treated equally so no one side gets immunity all war criminals will be prosecuted so now you have an awful lot of people who are in an awful lot of trouble. Fortunately for them, Zephram Cochrane has invented warp drive, and as well as that, you also have various sublight ships that are capable of leaving the planet and traveling across the solar system now. And the Martian colony effort and other colony efforts are beginning to ramp up. So in the in those years you see a lot of people leaving Earth. So the nations of the Earth agree that they need a joint special force to track down and apprehend these war criminals. And that is the main origins of MAKOs, Military Assault Commandos. These are special forces, guys. Basically, all the nations of the world pulled their special forces together to form MAKOs. And so, yeah, that's one of the things they would do is, you know, going out and uh, arresting war criminals. Sometimes they would do this with uniforms on, and sometimes they would do it out of uniform. But Makos are not just space SWATs. Again, they are military assault commandos. The commando is only one part of their job. You've got the military assault part. So where does that come from? Well... You thought that was crazy. I'm now going to bring up animated series lore. That's right. We're going to talk about the Kazinti Wars. So, yeah, this is where things get real wacky. Because notionally, the Kazinti were able to attack Earth using sublight ships. I'm, I'm going to take a lot of this with a pinch of salt. Right, the humans did not fight the Kazinti as a whole. They fought a Kazinti clan. And the Kazinti are basically, I always imagine them as being a bit of a diaspora. Yeah, there's a centralized state, but there's also a wide diaspora of the various Kazinti clans. And so what we're dealing with here is a single Kazinti clan. And now that could be quite a large number of folks, you know, in the, in the thousands. The second thing we'll do is we'll restrict this war to being, or conflict, to being in the near Sol area, given the relatively limited development of human warp drive in this time. Remember, humans probably didn't even get to warp 2 until about 2200. So that means that during most of this war, humans are fighting at warp 1, and they are largely going to be restricted to the near Sol area, possibly neighboring systems like Alpha Centauri. It's also worth saying that this war probably begins before there is a United Earth government or a United Earth Starfleet. But essentially what is happening, while there is no United Earth government, there's a lot of human colonization of space going on. 
up Mars and even further afield. Some are even leaving the system entirely, going as I say to Alpha Centauri on very long trips. And for the Kazinti, who find humans to be very tasty morsels, um, this is just a buffet waiting to happen. So it's just, it's free real estate. We have a problem here, and this is that Earth's fleets are too slow to respond. Remember, these are Warp 1 ships. So it takes them time to really get anywhere, even within the solar system, let alone further out in the other systems. You also have the problem that the space forces of this period are separate and don't necessarily cooperate. Um, you have two countries that operate basically completely independent space forces, those being United States Space Force and the People's Liberation Army Space Force. You then also have a bunch of multinational space forces. You have the British Commonwealth Space Forces. You have the joint Indo-Russian Space Force. You have the African Space Force. You have the European Space Force. You have the South American Space Force. Simply put, you have a lot of disparate forces with disparate capabilities and command structures and everything uh, that are very slow to respond. And, you know, it's not really clear who has jurisdiction over what sector, which bits of space belong to who, who has to police which sectors. And the Kazinti just, uh, they just exploit that for all that is worth. Like I say, it's just open season on human colonists at that point. So instead of using ships, which are too slow, the United Nations deploy garrisons of Makos to human colonies, human stations, even on board human sleeper ships, if necessary. Well, okay, you compare a human to a Kazinti, it doesn't look like much, but most Kazinti are not trained soldiers. They're warriors and they're formidable, but they fight as individuals. Makos are the best of the best. They are, they are all of Earth's special forces, merged into one organization you know that's navy seals that's sas that's spetsnaz they're all merged into into one you know these are elite professional trained soldiers many of them would have actually have been veterans of the third world war and even then would have trained the next generation of makos so they know their stuff and versus a kazinti yeah the, 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 I'm going to put my money on the Mako every time. So they were able to outfight the Kazinti and drive off the raids. And then we get the assault part of their name. Because in 2119, expeditionary operations would follow, which would eventually involve the complete driving out of Kazinti clans from the near Sol area. And they wouldn't be dealing with the Kazinti again until the 23rd century. But the Makos gave the Kazinti a thorough hiding. Arguably, the capabilities and the experience of the Makos and their special forces predecessors made up for the fact that Earth ships of the time were not very good. It's a little bit like in Halo. And it's also worth bearing in mind, this was less of a full-on war and more a series of skirmishes. Which is perfect for the Makos. Again, that's those are ideal conditions for Special Forces soldiers. It was perfect conditions for the Makos. And it's what gave them such a stellar reputation going into the 22nd century. So to conclude, we ultimately have three events that prompted the creation and evolution of the Makos. I would say the two most important are the post-atomic horror and the persecution of war criminals, that gave us the impetus for the formation of the Makos. And then the Kazinti conflict saw the development of the Makos into its own coherent military force with its own identity. Martian Crisis could have been a formative part, but fortunately wasn't. Uh, and if it had been a more formative part of the Makos identity, I think the Makos would have been regarded with a lot more controversy. You know, they'd be regarded as part of Earther oppression, so to speak. They are arguably extremely critical to the success of early human space travel. They secured the solar system, which, you know, we take for granted that no one was going to just come in and, and, and 
cause trouble. There's no reason why they why they wouldn't. Like, especially when humans start poking around and uh, kicking over hornets' nests. The main issue is that as time went on and as propulsion technology improved and humans were able to travel further and further afield, the reach of the Makos greatly diminished and they became much more reliant on Starfleet for their transportation. So at that point they kind of tied themselves to the, the fate of Starfleet. And as the technology of ships improved, the need for the Makos diminished as humans became much more comfortable engaging in space combat, whereas before the Makos were kind of an equaliser, draw the enemy into man-to-man -man combat. And then that's really how you get to the situation, the unfortunate situation that developed during the Romulan War, where the Makos didn't have a whole lot to do other than just sit there and twiddle their thumbs. And then, of course, post-war, they kind of suffered the same fate as their special forces predecessors. The special forces, which all were dissolved and fed into the Makos, the Makos would be dissolved and swallowed up by a newer and more dynamic organisation. It's sad, but it's a natural process of evolution. And fortunately, we do still see little bits of the spirit of Makos even lasting into the 23rd century, in little areas here and there. Uh, and certainly their role in early Earth history is beyond reproach. They were absolutely critical to the success of early human expansion into deep space. So I hope you enjoyed. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I will see you all in the next video. Thank you to my members, Jeffrey Ballard, Tully DT, and Rella, my commanders, Miami Jules, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Jeff Hallam, Bird Monster, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Guillermo Martinez, Das Blas, Adam Bowman, Nathaniel Mead, DM Tribal Typhoon, Gabe Logan, Gabe Logan, Mr. Flegel, and Nicholas Walsh. And I salute my centurions, Pendleberry. BOS Domestic Disputes, Marcus Hall, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Ocalcatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, Athies Collection, and Tobias Klein. And I thank all my loyal sub lieutenants. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.